Welcome to Vigorous Mindset. I'm Coach Steve. Let's talk about momentum, which I think is very poorly understood. And even though everybody says they want to reach their goals, a lot of people are not keeping up the pace, allowing them to reach their goals. And I see that with some of my clients. They commit to a program for a week, two weeks, one month, maybe three months, and then they fall off. They miss the momentum simply because they're not performing the tasks that they need to do to achieve their goals. So let's go over all the repetitive tasks that you need to perform because momentum is nothing more than stringing a lot of repetitive tasks together in order to get a successful day. And we have successful days upon successful weeks, upon successful months, upon successful years. You should be looking pretty good. You should be looking pretty good after a couple of years of successful days. So let's go over a simple checklist so you don't have to miss out on momentum because you might not realize how much little things contribute to your momentum. So the first things first, you should sleep according to your circadian rhythm. And I know if you're young, that's a little bit difficult to do because you like to go out and you like to go party. I know I used to be there as well. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you go out, you don't sleep according to your circadian rhythm. You're probably sleeping the opposite side, which is a little bit counterproductive. Now, when you're young, you can get away with it, you know, because your puberty hormones and you're still full of energy. But when you get a little bit older and you have a stressful job and a lot of work to do, Sleeping to your circadian rhythm becomes very, very, very essential. So what is the circadian rhythm? It's actually very simple. It's just sleeping from sunset to sunrise. And it depends on your geographic location. The sun might go down at 10 o'clock in the evening, or it might go down 4 o'clock in the evening, you know, especially during those winter times in Europe. Man, vitamin D deficiency is a real thing. So here in Thailand, the sun sets down around 6 o'clock. That's usually the time to start unwinding. Yeah. So you leave the work at the door. If you're self-employed, you're probably working a little bit longer than six o'clock. But if you're working for somebody else, you're employed. Six o'clock, you're already done. You go home, you get your workouts in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Start unwinding from everything by eight o'clock. And you might want to reduce the blue light filters in order to let your eyes rest a little bit and start preparing you for sleep. You should be in bed by 10, maybe 1030 if you've got some nighttime activities, which allows you to wake up at like six or seven in the morning, giving you eight to nine hours of sleep. Now, sedentary people might need six hours of sleep, but physically active people need eight to nine hours, especially when you're training to failure five days a week. Your brain and central nervous system might only need six hours of sleep per day to recover, but your body needs a little bit more, perhaps eight to nine hours to recover from the strenuous hypertrophy workouts and, and training to failure, which taxes your CNS as well. So besides taxing your brain and CNS with work and worldly drama, you're also taxing it with hypertrophy workouts and training to and beyond failure. So get your sleep in, sleep according to your circadian rhythm. Another trick to wake up according to your circadian rhythm is by sleeping with the curtains open, which allows daylight to slowly come into your room as the sun rises, which is a little bit different than waking up according to the alarm clock, because when the alarm clock goes off, you get a jolt of cortisol, but when sunlight comes into your room, your cortisol levels slowly, slowly rise and allowing you to wake up even before your alarm clock goes off. So you wake up a little bit more relaxed. So now that you're finally awake, let's go over all the tasks that you need to perform throughout the day to make it into a successful day. And the first thing you need to do is prepare all your own food by yourself. I don't really believe in meal prep companies. The problem with meal prep companies is that the food is old. Resistant carbs form when food cools down, making it a little bit more difficult to digest. And it might also mean that you're not getting all the micronutrients in because those resistant starches form bonds and those micronutrients get stuck, preventing absorption. Now, when you buy food from a meal prep company, the food is, of course, already chilled or frozen. So the resistant starches have already formed, making digestion a little bit difficult. So I would prefer everybody to make their own meals on the day they're going to eat them and keep their carbohydrate sources hot. So you can do that in a rice cooker or, or maybe bring a portable stove or a, a Tupperware that has an electric socket, allows you to heat it at all times. It will save you a lot of issues with digestion, especially when you eat very, very high amounts of food because resistant starches do become an issue when you're eating like 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 calories during the off season, preventing you to digest everything properly. So I would prefer everybody to make their own meals fresh. You can do that in the morning, space them out over Tupperware and then bring them with you to work. Or if you work from home, you can just eat them as is, right? That's what I do. I prepare meals as I need them, which gives me like a little mini break between work 
cooking, mini break, eating, mini break, and then I continue with my work. And I understand that's very, very cumbersome if you need to cook every morning for a whole day in advance. A lot of people prefer to cook in the weekend for a week in advance. But by the time Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, maybe Saturday hits, that food is pretty, pretty old. And the last thing you want is end up with food poisoning, which is going to ruin your momentum and set you back a couple weeks because you're losing all your gains out of your butthole. I think it's impossible to tell you what food sources you need to eat. As a golden rule, you can go with unprocessed food, something that digests well and that you enjoy eating. But if there's something that you enjoy eating, but it gives you gas, bloating, acid reflux, irritable bowel syndrome, etc., you're better off not eating it because it might inhibit nutrient absorption later in the day. So you can follow a simple elimination diet to figure out which foods work best for you and that you enjoy eating. In my case, that's rice, quinoa, white fish, beef, eggs, salmon, chia seeds, bread, which is processed, but culturally I found it acceptable. I prefer to eat bread over oatmeal because the yeast in bread makes it a little bit pre-digested. So when I eat a lot of bread during a carb up, I don't get the same feeling as eating a lot of oatmeal, which makes me incredibly sleepy. And it's probably because bread has a little bit less fiber compared to oatmeal, allowing it for me to pass it through. So if you have a lot of experience with your body and which food sources it can eat, you can compose your own diet and prepare that every day for yourself fresh. So it's still fresh at the end of the day, as long as you keep it hot. And then next day you prepare meals again. So whether that's four meals, five meals, six meals, maybe two meals, one meal per day, it doesn't matter. Make your own food, make sure it's fresh when you eat it. And you're going to be able to digest it very, very well because there's no resistant starches. Now to improve digestion further, which is also part of the checklist of a repetitive task, is by stopping to drink water 30 minutes before meals and 30 minutes after meals. Because you need stomach acid to be sufficient in order to break down all the food, which becomes increasingly important when you eat a large amount later on during the off season. Now, maybe during contest prep or a cutting phase, it might be beneficial to drink water with meals, diluting your stomach acid, allowing it to sit a little bit longer in your stomach, especially when food volume is a little bit lower, and so you don't feel so hungry. But during the maintenance of an off season phase, I would definitely recommend you to stop drinking water 30 minutes before meals. And if you need a little bit more incentive for digestion, apple cider vinegar, betaine hydrochloride, pepsin, ox bile, tutka, oregano oil helps with the gut microbiome. You can choose to use digestive enzymes, but I do feel that most people build up a tolerance to digestive enzymes, so I wouldn't use that too much. And what I found is that when you use digestive enzymes all the time, you're basically masking a food intolerance or a food that you can't digest because you lack the proper enzymes for it. And it could be that you need to eliminate it for maybe two or three months, allowing you to reduce the intolerance and then you can reintroduce it. But if you're taking digestive enzymes constantly, you're kind of masking that and now you're not really sure if you're intolerant or not. So in that sense, I would only use digestive enzymes, you know, when you're going to a hotel buffet and you're eating a lot of food that you haven't eaten in months and you need a little bit of digestion support. So for cheat meals, you know, something like that that you haven't really eaten for a long time, digestive enzymes might be beneficial. You got to keep in mind that there's seven, eight, nine different digestive enzymes. So make sure the digestive enzymes that you take in supplemental form are going to match the food that you're going to eat. Because it's a little bit silly to take digestive enzymes for dairy products where you're going to eat sushi. So make sure that matches. So space your water away from meals 30 minutes before and 30 minutes after to optimize digestion further. Third on the checklist is supplements and the correct time that you need to take them because not all supplements should be taken with meals. Some need to be taken in between meals. Some need to be taken upon waking on an empty stomach. So you need to figure out when to time your supplements on the right way. And this, if you're taking a ton of supplements like I do, that means, you know, you have a medicine cabinet with maybe six different compartments. You're upon waking supplements, your with meal supplements, your in between meal supplements, and your evening supplements. It gets a little bit cumbersome, but as long as you eat, take your supplements and maybe medicines or oral steroids or whatever performance enhancer you choose to use in oral form. So figure out the timing of your supplements as a general guideline. All the multivitamins or micronutrients I would take with meals because normally they would be contained within food, right? But now you're adding them on top of food, allowing them to absorb a little bit slower because the food digestion is buffering the vitamins a little bit. But medicines or performance enhancers, I would take on an empty stomach. And if you're taking oral steroids, it might be beneficial to take them pre-workout because it 
gives you a little bit of boost during your workout, allowing you to train at a higher workout capacity. Whereas medicine, it's usually better just to take them upon waking and to stomach. Most of the medicines were designed or chosen with a 24 hour half life. So you just take them once per day, maybe twice per day. If you want to have a little bit more stable blood levels upon waking and before bed on an empty stomach, allowing you to have the most stable serum concentrations of the medicine or performance enhancing drug you prefer to use. The timing of injectable steroids might not be as important as the timing of oral steroids because injectables usually come with an ester attachment allowing to extend their half-life to several days or maybe even weeks. So testosterone anethate, for example, has a half-life of 10 to 12 days and, you know, depending on the carrier oral, it might be even longer. So castor oil extends the half-life of testosterone anethate to almost 34 days. But when you take a testosterone propionate in MCT oil from an underground lab, the half-life might be reduced to two or three days instead of the labeled four to five days because the carry oil reduces it because MCT has a lower viscosity. If you want to get the most stable blood levels, it's probably advised to do daily injections, we call it micro-injections, and whether that's subcutaneous, that's part of a hormone replacement therapy protocol, or intramuscular when you're on cycle and you're injecting one milliliter, two milliliters, maybe even three milliliters per day, it's probably better to do that intramuscularly. If you inject whatever compound you choose to use, if you inject every day, you'll get the most stable serum concentrations, unless you chose to go for testosterone suspension or trimbalone suspension or wind suspension, you might have to inject multiple times per day because the half-life is between eight to 24 hours, depending on which muscle group you inject, because not every muscle group has the same amount of clearance rate compared to others. So not to complicate it too much, daily injections is probably advised, and then you have to keep into consider the aromatization of testosterone to estrogen. So if you do micro injections every day and it results in and the serum estrogen concentration that's too low, it might be beneficial to space the injections further apart. Testosterone levels peak twice per week, let's say on Monday and Friday, allowing a little bit more estrogen conversion in the time serum concentrations are higher compared to daily micro injections. So you have a little bit of a roller coaster effect, which most people won't even notice a difference. So in that sense, your injection protocol is probably going to be highly individual. If you want the most stable concentrations of whatever compound you end up using, daily injections are advised. But keep in mind that you still need to maintain your serum estrogen levels. And if they're too low, you might be better off spacing your injections apart, allowing for testosterone to convert into estrogen in between the peaks. In this video, I won't go over the timing of growth hormone, insulin, or any of the other peptides you can choose from. It highly depends on your current rate of development and how much you're using and how your diet is structured and how your training is structured. So again, that all highly depends on what you're doing. For the rest of your bodybuilding inspirations, just make sure those injections are consistent, contributing to your momentum. Another part of the checklist is cardio. And I know everybody's trying to find a way around it by pharmacology, but you still need to do cardio. It's plain and simple. You're not doing it for fat loss. You're doing it for cardiovascular health. And there's no other way to stimulate cardiovascular health Medium intensity, steady state, cardio, upon waking, 20 to 30 minutes, and it's just something you incorporate into your daily schedule. You wake up, you have your coffee, you handle maybe a couple emails, you get on the cardio machine, or you walk outside, it's free, 20 to 30 minutes, medium intensity. Bring a heart rate monitor so you can check you're actually doing medium intensity and not this low intensity stuff that doesn't improve your cardiovascular health. It might be beneficial to burn body fat when you're 6% body fat, you do low intensity then and only then because you don't have so much body fat to burn and you don't want to deplete your glycogen levels and especially not burn away your legs by burning intramuscular protein stores. Medium intensity the rest time of the year, you'll burn a little bit more fat, but you're also training your heart to carry around all this extra mass because being over 80 kilos, 90 kilos, 100 kilos is not natural for most people. And when you take steroids at super physiological dosages, allowing you to carry 20, 30, 40, 60 kilos, 100 pounds of extra muscle mass, you need to train your heart accordingly just to be able to facilitate it with oxygen and carry all the nutrients around. So please do your cardio just for overall health, train your heart to sustain that heart rate for about 30 minutes at medium intensity, allowing the rest of your day to be a lot easier, preventing you from snoring at night, allowing you to train at the highest possible capacity because your heart is not the rate limiting factor, your muscles is. And I think that's an issue with a lot of people. It's the heart that gives out, not the legs or the chest or whatever body part that you choose to train. It's the heart, you know, preventing uh, proper oxygen 
from reaching the muscle, allowing them to train to failure beyond and into infinity for the most amount of stimulation. So again, train your heart, just do your daily fasted cardio upon waking. Let's not go over all this uh, minutia of when it's the best time to do it. Wake up, do your cardio, get it out of the way, job done. You now, when it comes to the workouts, and it's something that's come to the limelight over the last few years with Instagram and YouTube and other social media platforms, so that everybody can show each other how they train. So you see over the last few years with progressive overload, people started sharing the workouts, they get stronger, they add reps, the quality of the reps are better and better and better. And this is the way to train. So you have to look at it this way. Your entire workout is structured towards your perfect working sets. So you maybe do a couple working uh, warm-up sets, you do a couple feeder sets, the primer CNS for that working set. I'm going over it very, very fast, but you know, you probably need to do a little bit more research when it comes to working out because it's a very, very big topic that people discuss hours and hours and hours on end. So when you get to your working set, every rep, the tempo, the time under tension, the execution, the form, it should all be on the target muscle. Yeah, and it should be perfect for the muscle group you're trying to train. So it might be that you're doing six reps with very high time under tension for chest, and you're doing 20 reps uh, with very low time and a very high uh, fast-paced rep scheme for shoulders, for example. You have to figure out which body parts responds to which stimulation, and then make sure you don't deviate from that type of stimulation until it doesn't work anymore, and you need to change up your protocol. So just the, the very simple rule for that, you go to the gym, you focus on the perfect execution of each rep. Each rep is stringed together into a set for a perfect set. Then hopefully you string out a couple perfect sets together in a workout for a perfect workout. And you do that over a few years and you're going to be really, really big. And as long as you eat and you might take performance enhancers to facilitate recovery. Yeah, that's a very simple formula for a very, very broad sense that is working out. You just got to make sure that you're present. I think a lot of people are not very, very present. They just go through the motions. They see something on Instagram and they try to duplicate it. When in reality, they don't need to duplicate it by looking at it. They need to duplicate it by feeling it. And it might mean that you will never get the same contraction that I get in my back, but you might have a better contraction in your chest than I do. Well, everybody has different body parts. And you need to figure out what works for you. So that's in that sense, training. Everything you're doing is very deliberate and don't let anybody distract you during the workout because working out for bodybuilders, strongmen or strength athletes, it's not a social thing, maybe before and after the workout, but it, the working out is not a social thing. You're not there to chat. You're not there to look at girls. You're not there to chat on social media. You're in there to work and you're in there to make progress. And you only have an hour, an hour, 15 minutes to make as much progress regarding hypertrophy stimulation as you can. And then you need to get the f out and go home and feed the body with all the meals you prepped in the morning. Keep that in mind. So you do all these tasks throughout the day. That's one successful day. And you can make a very, very simple checklist. You have six meals, for example. You have uh, 20 supplements that you take. You have, uh, let's say, 25 sets, including working sets, feeder sets, working uh, back off sets, uh, warm up sets, whatever. 30 sets of that, uh, maybe a couple injections, one injection, two injection, three injection. I don't know how advanced you are. Some people need to inject multiple times per day. So again, all that contributes. And cardio, yeah, also cardio, don't forget that. Do that cardio. Make a little list. You can put it out in an Excel sheet and just start tacking all the boxes. Yeah, just tacking up X's, X's and O's. Yeah, if you did it correctly, you're next. And now if you didn't do it correctly. If you tacked all the boxes that day, you can write it off in the big calendar. X, one day, perfectly, one successful day. Now it's your job to tack all the boxes every day on all these repetitive tasks, day in, day out, day in, day out, over and over and over and over, over again. And make sure you fill out that entire month, that one month of gains. One month of absolute perfect gains. You're going to make tremendous progress. I promise you. I promise you, you're going to make tremendous progress over the course of a month that you're doing everything correctly. And now you need to put everything into place to make sure you have month upon month and keep that momentum going until you actually reach your goals. Because one month of progress, you can see in the pictures, but most people don't reach their goals in one month. They might need four months or they might need a year or maybe five years to reach your goals. So again, you got to keep that pace going and make sure you put everything into place and do everything in your power to keep this momentum and keep you going forward.
Now, there's a couple things that can be considered as a detractor, which are sometimes out of your hands, but you're still able to control it. So one of them is, for example, injuries, which if you're training correctly, injuries shouldn't occur unless you put that ego with you or you bring your ego with you to the gym. And this might be a downfall of progressive overload where people reach a point of strength, which is very, very close to reaching injury. And then they still want to progress a little bit further. And the, the difference between training safely and tearing yourself apart could be one pound. It's that simple. Or it could be just a day off where you didn't sleep correctly. So keep that in mind. As you get really, really strong, you get also more injury and injury prone. And you might be able to mitigate some of that with pharmacology, like a TB500 or BPC-157 or more growth hormone or more collagen supplements or whatever supplements you chose to use to keep your connective tissue in place and strengthened. But the stronger you get, the more you're risking injury. And maybe at that sense, volume might be a little bit more beneficial where you work up to your highest safety working weight and then you increase the volume to increase the hypertrophy stimulus instead of trying to chase the numbers and get stronger and stronger and stronger every day. I would look at it this way. If you can't do, let's say your rep range is four to six reps, for example, that's your ideal rep range when you're coming to strength. If you can't do four reps executively and a fifth rep and a sixth rep with a little pause, you're probably training too heavy. And if your rep range is 12 reps and you can't do eight reps consecutively with a ninth to 10th, you know, a little break in between. So the, the first eight reps should be kept in motion. You're probably risking injury. So I see that with some people that follow progressive overload, they do one rep, they pause, one rep, one rep, one rep. Okay, they still got six reps, but they're losing time under tension because the weight is so heavy that they can't physically or the CNS can't take it to do those reps in succession. And that's why I feel progressive overload fails. Now, that might not be the case for you. Maybe you're not that injury prone, but I'm getting a little bit older. So the last thing I want is to tear myself apart because I'm chasing numbers. So when I reach that point where the weight is really, really heavy and I can't perform the reps in succession anymore, I just keep it there until I belt up my reps in succession so I can do six reps or eight reps or 10 reps in succession without stopping. And again, you're increasing the time under tension, so it's still progressive overload. So injury is something that might happen. It might happen in the gym or it might happen outside where you slip on a frozen street. Again, it ruins the momentum. It happens. Just be mindful of it. Things you can avoid is by going skydiving or bungee jumping or, uh, you know, uh, insane or motorcycle stunt driving. You know, all these things you can avoid by yourself, but injuries might still happen in the gym. So in that sense, that might be able to detract from your momentum and it's probably out of your hands. You still got to put in the work and prevent injury the best way possible. Another thing that might detract from your goals or momentum is a holiday. So when you go on holiday, obviously you can't put everything into place to you know do all the repetitive tasks that you need to perform to reach your goals. But it's mostly about damage control. Because when you go on holiday, you see new things, you see new food, you want to eat a little bit off the menu of what you're usually eating. You're probably not going to go to the gym as often because you know, you're there to sightsee or maybe you're just there to relax and take a mental break from the whole repetitive thing that you're trying to do to reach your goals. I understand. I do the same thing. I completely detox from bodybuilding when I do go on holiday. And then it's mostly about caloric restriction. So you can follow like an intermittent fasting approach where you don't eat so much food during the day. And then you have a lunch and a dinner. Try to find a couple gyms that you can train in on your holiday. It's always fun to train in different gyms all over the world. And you can call it sightseeing as well. You know, you train at your home gym day in, day out. You go to a different gym in a different country and see what that gym is all about. You don't really have to do cardio on holiday because if you do intermittent fasting approach and you're sightseeing in the morning portion, and even though it's probably low intensity cardio, it's probably for a very long duration, so it should balance itself out. And again, holiday is mostly about damage control and preventing you to gain fat, which sets you back further. And all the muscle mass that you lose or deflate from glycogen depletion is going to come right back when you come back from holiday. So don't worry about that too much. You pick up the pace, you get into the groove, your gains are restored and you can progress from there. So your momentum will return as soon as you get back from holiday. I often hear people talk about sacrifices that they need to make. It's usually for the beginners, you know, they, they come from a sedentary or average life and they transition into a fitness or bodybuilding or strongman or powerlifting life, which has restrictions. Let's put it that way, restrictions, right? You have goals and it comes with a certain amount of restrictions. Now, you shouldn't see the sacrifices. 
because you're taking those things out of your life to reach your goals. So if ice cream doesn't contribute to your goals, why should you take it? It's probably detracting from your goals because it's making you fat. Now, if you're eating ice cream every day, it's certainly making you fat. But if you're having a little bit of ice cream on a Sunday with your partner or friends, it's probably contributing to your mental state or well-being. So there's a difference there. It either makes you fat or it contributes to your mental well-being because ice cream is enjoyable. And it's the same for every other food. You don't have to restrict all the food sources during the off-season, of course. But during a contest prep, there's a cheat meal, which is one meal per week. And that's it. And as soon as you start eating off the plan, you're stepping away from reaching your goals. Food intake is something you're going to have to learn to control because during the off season, you're going to be full and you probably don't want to eat, but you still have to eat. And then during a cut is phase, you're hungry and you're not allowed to eat. So you have to balance those two and make sure you remember during your cutting phase that you were stuffed during the off season. And during your off season, you have to remember that you were starving during your cutting phase yeah? and fuel on both feelings. And then you should be able to reach your goals without too much issue. Yeah? Keep that in mind. Every time you eat off the plan, whether you eat less or too much, it's taking away from your momentum. I think the biggest detractor from you reaching your goals are going to be in your surroundings. And those are going to be toxic people around you. So that could be family, it could be friends, it could be even your partner. They might not agree with what you're doing. And as long as you agree, it's your body, your choice, your responsibility. And as long as you're not hurting anybody around you, you got to have to do certain things and certain restrictions to help you reach your goals. Now, maybe your partner or your family or your friends don't agree with that. And they, you know, you might grow a little bit apart or they might force a little bit of toxicity on you by belittling you or making fun of you of your bodybuilding aspirations or just not being supportive altogether. Maybe some of the friends subject you to peer pressure, forcing you to go out drinking or taking drugs or going out partying. Again, that's something I can't really say. What is your situation? I remember that some of my family members were not very, very um, enthusiastic about my bodybuilding aspirations. So I just ignored them. Just on you know, a party, so just don't go talk with them. It's a, it's a waste of time. You are who you are. You have certain goals. And if people try to belittle you or not try to be supportive, just don't waste your time on it. And it, it could be your friends as well. Bro, you want to go out drinking? You have to make a choice. Do you want to go out drinking or do you want to focus on your bodybuilding? You know, you can go drinking once a month and still maintain a friendship. And you can focus the other 30 days of the month on bodybuilding. You still go out partying once a month. It shouldn't detract from your goals too much. But if you go out drinking three times a week, your bodybuilding is uh, it's not going to happen for you. It's that simple. I think the to most toxic thing is going to be a non-supportive partner because those are going to be around you 24-7 or, you know, if you're not living together, you're going to be dating or going out and doing stuff together. If they're not supportive of your bodybuilding aspirations or your fitness aspirations, they simply feel that you're wasting their time on something else. And I've had that with a previous relationship where I'm going to the gym or I'm cooking or I'm restricting my diet or I'm doing you know, injections and they feel that I should be spending that time on them, it, it's not going to work. You're better off separating. Goodbye. Good luck. And you focus on your bodybuilding. Again, if that's more important to you, you should. Maybe the girl or the boy or whatever is more important to you. Okay, you focus on that, but you're sacrificing a very big portion of yourself just to be with that person. So you're better off finding a person that has the same aspirations, the same goals, and the same work ethic as you do. And now the work ethic of two people can combine and form a proper relationship, allowing two people to reach their goals because both partners are supportive of each other's fitness aspirations. So performing all these small repetitive tasks day in, day out, day in, day out, and perhaps making changes to your social network and removing all the toxic people from your life, removing all the things that don't contribute to your goals or could detract from them, and it's usually food or people. Those two things are the most common problem areas. So you remove the toxic people, you remove the processed food doesn't contribute to your goals this is your new standard of living and it's going to be your life it's going to be the same stuff day in day out day in day out until you reach your goals and in the meantime you might have a holiday or maybe a couple holidays if you have long-term goals but you should do everything to keep that momentum going and make sure that you don't do anything that's detracting from reaching your goals. And in the meantime, besides your bodybuilding or fitness aspirations, you can apply the same thing for productivity for work 
or the same thing for relationships. Or increase your knowledge base by learning new stuff. And it all requires momentum and a tremendous amount of work ethic. And it's the work ethic that separates you from the average crowd. So I hope that helps. I hope that sends you in the right direction of making sure you put everything into place to reach your goals and eliminate everything that doesn't contribute so you don't set yourself back. I really hope that helps. Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to leave a like or subscribe on your way out. And I'll see you in the next video.